Hello class, welcome to Dr. Gordon's Social 101 course. Today we are going to be talking about social problems. In our discipline of sociology, looking at social problems is something that we're going to do a lot and it's something that we're going to have to look at in a different way than someone who is not a sociologist would look at. We look at things for the big picture and how interrelated it is with society as a whole. So again, let's just talk about social problem. Um, a social problem is a social condition that has negative consequences for our social world. So they affect society as a whole, even though looking at them initially, it may seem like it only affects one class of people, one type of people, but social problems, that's why they're social. They affect us all. So to understand social problems entirely, um, we initially want to look at, again, what is sociology? Sociology is a systematic study of individuals and social structures. Um, so to understand why each social problem is a problem that affects us all, you have to look with this social imagination. So we talked about social imagination last class, but we'll go over it again. Again, the social imagination is the understanding of how everything is connected. This term was originally coined by C.W. Wright Mills in his 1959 book entitled The Sociological Imagination, and it's used to describe the type of insight offered by our discipline of sociology. When you learn to use your social imagination, imagination, your sociological imagination, you learn to look at the world through a whole different lens. So I like to compare it to the concept of rose-colored glasses. When you put on rose-colored glasses, you're no longer seeing the world for the colors that it is. You're seeing the world in different hues of red and violets and, you know, what's yellow might look orange it's going to change your entire outlook. And that's the same thing that our sociological lenses do. When you have your sociological lenses on, you start seeing problems, not how they relate to you, but how they relate to history, to one's social location, to one's everything about the individual, because each individual is going to have a different relation with society. So you're now seeing the world that the world is made up of many different social constructions. Um, most of these social constructions are so deeply ingrained in our society, in our way of life, that many of us don't even give them a second look. We fail to even think that these are social constructions. We think that they are fact. That is the way things are. But when you become a sociologist, you start learning and you start seeing that that is not the case for most of the things in our daily lives. So, again, to understand social problems, we need to understand social constructions. So let's take a look at what might be a social construction um, that has led to a social problem. Let's look at social constructions that have led to the social problem of social inequality. So, do I have some hands raised? Okay. Okay, race. So someone said race. That is a huge social construction that we face today. Race. Um, okay, gender. Gender is one as well. And class and capitalism. Now, class is something largely related to race. So today we're going to focus on race. Um, and we'll look at these others. Uh, we'll focus on race. We'll also talk a little bit about class because they kind of go hand in hand. And we'll look at these others like gender and capitalization next class. So going back to race. Um, how do we know race is socially constructed? I mean, some would argue that it's not. Um, so let's look at the definition of race, the Merriam-Webster's definition of race. And that is something used to categorize people that share biological traits that a society thinks are important. So, again, some people are, would argue that 
how is race socially constructed if it's based on biological differences? We can't change biological differences. We're born that way. And so race is something that we're born into. However, that last part of that definition, which was what society thinks are important, that's the key to the social construction. You see, race is different wherever you go. Different things are considered important. Here in America, we place a large a large importance on skin color. Um, if you're white skin, if you're considered white, whether you're Latino descent, Italian, Jewish, whatever your ancestry, if you have white skin, and especially if you have white skin, light eyes, and light hair, you're going to just be considered white. Whereas if you're dark skin, you're gonna usually put put in an ethnic category. It may not always be black, you may be Cuban, you may be Latino, you may be something else, but if you have dark skin, you're not going to be considered white. And that's why, you know, race is strictly applying to our skin color in America. We have lots of different color eyes, we have different nose shapes, different type of lips, but that's, we don't say, oh, if they have brown eyes and they have blue eyes, they're different races. No, it's strictly based on skin color. And so that's why it's, um, that's the basis of our social construction of race. So in some societies, um, like in Africa, for example, they place differences on nose shapes and features, you know, because they're all African-American in, in some areas. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, African. Yet they still categorize themselves differently to give different opportunities. And that's what race is um, largely constructed for. And again, a century ago, race was different. That's another way we know that it's socially constructed. A century ago, if you were not Protestant white, you were considered ethnic. So, therefore, if you were Italian, if you were Jewish, if you were, um, you know, if you were Irish, those are all people who were denied chances when they got to America because you could tell that they were from somewhere else. They were not your typical Protestant white. However, as time went on, these people integrated into our society became they didn't have accents, they didn't, you know, they became just like all the other white people. And it was harder to differentiate, and therefore they just became white. So, again, other cultures couldn't do that. Uh, other African Americans, darker Latinos, we could not just become Americanized and then say we're white. So, again, they, that is how they socially constructed by skin color. And this, unfortunately, America used this to give people of European descent the upper hand in other social constructions like class, for example. Um, they were given a lot less opportunities when you had darker skin versus when you were these more lighter skin Europe, people of European descent. And this led to the big problem we face today of racial inequality. So you see, if you don't understand the whole history of a social problem, you might tend to think people are always at fault for their situations. However, being black in America comes with a whole different field of obstacles than for being white. Being white in America comes with many privileges that come from the better life chances they've been given from generation to generation. Um, in a way, the U.S. was designed to hinder African Americans or people of ethnic descent in their everyday lives, whereas it was designed to propel white Americans forward. One example of this is in the 1930s, when African Americans were denied the same home loans that were given to white Americans. This set the stage for the huge racial gap that we see in America today. Um, so whereas my great-great-great-grandfather was told, no, you can't live here because it was redlined, meaning that it was an area 
that would not rent to African Americans, a white person's great great grandfather was given a fantastic home loan with a very low interest rate and an easy mortgage to pay and they were able to pay off their home and hand off that home from generation to generation whereas my great grandfather had to live in an apartment his whole life and was never able to accumulate that same wealth home ownership is the number one way to accumulate wealth in America and many minorities a disproportionately higher amount of minorities were denied and face and still today face a significantly higher amount of hurdles in going through that process of getting to home ownership. So, hopefully this helped you understand a little bit more about the social problem of race and how this affects people today. And it does affect us all. So today for our homework, I'd like you to read the first chapter of The Sociological Imagination by C.W. Wright Mills and write a one-page paper about how your race has personally affected you, whether negatively or positively, in your life. And also write a one paragraph at the end talking about how each of us can do something small to bring a solution to the problem of racial inequality and the wealth gap. So this concludes my lecture for today and look forward to seeing those homework assignments. Everyone have a wonderful day. Class dismissed.